Um, so if you have a Bible with you this morning, or I know there are some kind of scattered around if you can reach one, um, turn with me to John 1, verse 14. Just one verse today. Yeah. John 1, 14. It says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Can you pray with me? God, we thank you for this one short but powerful verse, and we ask that you teach us from it this morning more about who you are and who we are as your people. In your name we pray. Amen. So we've been looking throughout Advent and on Christmas Eve at how God radically breaks into our world, um, sometimes in disruptive ways, sometimes in, as Jeremy talked about, kind of scandalous ways, um, but ways that change our lives. Um, and we've been looking at that all throughout Advent, and that's what Christmas is really all about, right? Jesus came and broke into our world in a very literal, tangible way. And so we read just one little verse this morning, and it's a very famous, you've probably memorized it before, you've probably heard sermons on this before, and you will again, I guarantee you. But I think that this verse holds a really powerful image of how God broke into our world that first Christmas. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. Now I'm going to do something, take a little risk here that we don't often do at Harbor Church, and I'm going to talk about Greek. So, <laughs> don't glaze over on me here. <laughs> um, the Greek word, I want to look at this word um, for God dwelling. It says the word became flesh and dwelled among us. And the Greek word for dwelled or made his dwelling is eskenesin. So just to make sure you're with me, say, Askenison. Good job, you passed Greek. <laughs> the word, the word Askenison means, it's kind of not quite a technical term, but almost a technical term for pitching a tent. You know, if you were to go camping in ancient Greece, you would Askenison with your tent, or you build a homestead. You know, it's kind of a picture of pioneers in early America going west and Askenisoning in California or in Washington. <laughs> it's, it's this image of building a home, not just kind of sitting and you know staying just for a couple days and moving on, but making a homestead, pitching a tent, or even maybe a home away from home. But there, there's a sense of building roots there. The same word is what, you know, when it talks in Greek about Israel pitching their tents in the wilderness for 40 years as they made their way to the promised land. They use this word, eskenosin. And in Revelation, when it talks about God coming back and dwelling with his people forever, he eskenosins with his people forever. So there's this sense here that the word, Jesus Christ, became flesh and eskenosined among us. He built a home among us. He really moved in. You've probably heard by now the way that Eugene Peterson put it in the message. Um, kind of a classic line from the message now. He says, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's, that's exactly, exactly right. Jesus Christ became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. But I think this idea of moving in, of really kind of digging in and building roots, is, has huge implications on how we're called to live in our own lives, in our own even neighborhoods. Um, uh, the very first apartment that Jeremy and I ever lived in was um, this really tiny, about 425 square feet, kind of gross little apartment in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, Jeremy actually lived there first on his own, and then after we got married, I moved into kind of his bachelor pad. But we never really made it home. You know, we knew it was temporary. We weren't going to stay in Grand Rapids forever. We were heading to seminary in California. So we got all of our furniture from a thrift store. I don't think we spent more than 50 bucks on anything in that apartment. And we, um, we didn't even take the time to decorate a whole lot. There were certain things that we didn't really even store. We just kind of threw it in a corner and called it good enough. It was, it was very kind of a temporary little make-do sort of shelter until we moved on to something bigger and better which the next thing, by the way, was 550 square. <laughs> Not that much bigger. Uh, but we, we never really moved in. We didn't escape us in so much. We just kind of lived there for a little while. But that's not what Jesus did when he came to earth. He really, really moved in. 
Jesus wasn't kind of flippant with his time here like Jeremy and I were with this apartment in Michigan. He, Jesus had a job. You know, he was a carpenter, which my family and I got in a big discussion the other day. Was he really a carpenter with wood or more of a stonemason? But that's neither here nor there. But he, he had a job, is the point. And he had friends. We read in the Gospels about um, how he was close to Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He wept at Lazarus' death because he was such a dear friend. And we read about his family. He had siblings and parents kind of weird to think about Jesus having all these very kind of earthly human things, but he did. He had roots. I think one of the best sort of illustrations about how kind of rooted Jesus was in his hometown is in Luke 4. I always kind of laugh at this story. There's the story of Jesus that's starting his ministry in Luke, and he goes to the synagogue in his hometown where he grew up, and he, he gets up and starts reading the gospel, or not the gospel, the prophet Isaiah. And he reads this big, beautiful prophecy about the Messiah and how the Messiah will come in power. And then he says, today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And everyone looks at each other and says, isn't that Joseph's son? You can kind of hear the sort of small town. We know this guy. He's, what's he talking about? We saw him grow up. And this is Jesus, Joseph's son. I just think it's such a great example to see how kind of entrenched and rooted Jesus really was in his hometown. People knew him as Joseph's son. I'm constantly, or sorry, Jesus didn't, um, Jesus didn't do what Jeremy and I did in that first apartment. He really moved in and he built roots and, and um, moved into the neighborhood, like Eugene Peterson said. I'm constantly kind of reminded of the difference of this now that Jeremy and I have a house. And I promise someday I'll stop using this as a sermon illustration. We have a house now, and it's, it's such a different feeling of kind of rootedness in this place. We own a little piece of Seattle now, or we're, we're working on it. Um, <laughs> um, but it's, it matters more what happens in our neighborhood. We care now when we read about how Greenwood had all kinds of packages stolen off of front porches, because that's our neighborhood. And um, we've started kind of checking out the stores and the coffee shops and the restaurants, and we have this stack of frequent coffee shop cards now. And I even found a store that sells shoes that are cute and comfortable, which is hard to find. <laughs> we're, we're getting to know our neighbors. We know now that there's um, Chris and Tim next door, and they brought us a bottle of wine, and now we can talk over the fence. And um, Heidi and Eric are are sharing our, our backyards meet, and our dog now has started stealing their little boy's matchbox cars from under the fence. <laughs> we're, we're finding these roots, and we're um, feeling much more entrenched. We're moving in to the neighborhood. And that's what Jesus did in his time here. But what makes this so important is that this verse that we read this morning says that that's how we saw God's glory. Jesus moved in and he got close and specific and tangible. And that's how we saw God's glory and grace and truth. And that, I think, is the key for us this Christmas. As Jeremy and I are getting to know our neighbors and getting to know our neighborhood, our hope and prayer is that somehow, in some small way, God will use us and our neighbors will see God's glory and grace and truth. Somehow. That's the goal here. This is what we do when we move in. I have a friend um, named Ashley Vendracht, who is a pastor in the Christian Reformed Church, like John and I are, um, and she and her husband lead um, Graduate Christian Fellowship at the University of Washington. It's a student ministry for graduate students and staff. Um, anyway, she wrote a really great piece in kind of an online magazine um, about this idea of Jesus moving in and seeing his glory. So I just wanted to read a little bit of what she wrote. Um, I don't think she would ever watch these videos, but if you do, actually, sorry, I didn't ask first. But no, no. <laughs> um, it says Jesus moved into the neighborhood, and it's then, John says, that we saw his glory. We saw that he was full of grace and truth. Sure, we creatures could always see the glory of the creator, but in his advent, in his incarnation, when he moved closer still, we saw it in a whole new way. We saw it in tiny hands and feet, in thin cries from a manger, and later in laugh lines on his face, in the healing touch of his hands, in his tears and teaching, in his broken body and shed blood. 
We saw it when he looked into our eyes and said the words we needed to hear the most, you are forgiven. This is close. This is God's incarnation. It's Christ in community with us, and it's full of his glory and grace and truth. It's because Christ moved in so close and so deeply that we can know him and love him. And it's because Christ came in so close, we can invite others to know him and love him too. And that's what I think is so important about this idea of moving in as we leave Christmas and go into the new year. Just in this act of Jesus coming to earth, we have this incredible model of how we can live our lives as God's people. Last week, John talked about Jesus moving in in more and more specific ways. Um, John used the idea of the force. You know, Jesus isn't like the force in Star Wars, this kind of amorphous power that goes with us. But he's something real and tangible. He was a baby in a manger and a teenage girl with his mother. It was very real and specific ways. And we're called to move in like that in our own lives, too. Our love and our faith and our Christ-likeness can't just be like the force in Star Wars. It needs to be real and specific and tangible. We need to really move in. And in our moving in, in our getting closer and more specific, that's how we can see God's glory and how others can see God's glory and grace and truth in us. I think this moving in can happen in all the spheres of our lives. This is asking you to remember sermons from months ago, so we'll see if, if this is possible. But one time, John and I both talked about um, our unavoidable and our avoidable worlds. I'm seeing a couple nodding heads. Some of you remember, yay. <laughs> um, but we, we can move in in, I think, both of these areas, in both our unavoidable world, our, our families, our friends, where we work, those places, and the people that we see every day, and we can't avoid them if we wanted to. Um, and then we have our avoidable worlds, where we don't have to go. And maybe it's somewhere in a different country. Maybe it's just two doors down. It can be as close or as far as, as you think. But... I think this moving in can happen in, in both of these worlds of ours, the avoidable world and the unavoidable world. I think that we're called to move in, to connect deeply and get closer and more specific with our families and with our friends. As Christians, we're called to love and reconciliation and to accountability. And that's what we have the opportunity to do with each other. That's why things that happen here at Harvard Church on a weekly basis, like movie nights or going to the Pacific Science Center together or um, the gospel choir, things like this that happen every week are so important because it gives us the opportunity to move in a little closer with one another, right? It gives us the opportunity to get to know each other and to get a little more specific and a little deeper and have the chance to see God's glory and grace and truth through each other. This is what Christ showed us how to do when he broke into our world that first Christmas. As followers of Christ, we need to take this idea of moving in seriously. Christ did it, and now we're called to do it. But to me, this extends a little bit further than just our unavoidable worlds, and I think we can even take it a little bit literally. I think God calls us to move in right where we pitch our tent. As Christians at Harvard Church, we're called to move into this neighborhood. For some of us, this is the neighborhood where we live or where we work anyway, so maybe that's easy, but some of us drive in from somewhere else. But still, God called us to be Harvard Church right here in Crown Hill in Seattle. And I think he has a reason for that. And he calls us to move in closer because when we do that, that's when we display God's glory and grace and truth. Just like my hope for Jeremy and me in our new house is that our neighbors will see God. My hope and my prayer for Harvard Church is that those who live in these houses we can see out the window or who meet us at QFC on Holman or at Dick's or Holy Ground's coffee shop, that they will see God's grace and truth and glory through us. But that can't happen if we keep them at a distance. We need to move in closer because that's what Christ did for us. We have a calling in our neighborhoods where we live and where we gather together as God's people 
to move in and to get specific and to get deeper because our God isn't a God who stays at a distance. Our God is the God who moved in so close that he died for us on the cross. Our God is the God who spent nine months in the womb of a teenage girl and who was born in a stable and who had friends and family and a job. He moved in close so that we could see his glory and we're called to do the same now. In Jeremiah 29, verse 7, God speaks to Israel through the prophet Jeremiah about this idea of moving in. This is all over the Bible. God says, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have called you. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. God tells the people of Israel, look, I've brought you to this place. And now I need you to work in it and build roots here and seek its peace to get a little closer and a little deeper and to really move in so that all the people around you can see my glory. It's true for Israel and it's true for us now. We're called to seek the peace of our city, to seek the peace of Crown Hill or even of Woodenville or Renton or Kirkland or Greenwood or um, Maple Leaf or all, we're all the places that we all represent. We're called to move in and seek the peace of that place and that this place and to show God's glory. I've been thinking and praying a lot about how we as Harbor Church can do this together, how we can really move into Crown Hill. And I think we've done that in some ways. We've got our garden and our preschool and Cub Scouts and um, things that are happening in the neighborhood. But I think we can do more. And I think that God calls us to keep getting deeper and to keep getting closer. So I would love it if you would think and pray about that with me and even talk about it sometimes. <laughs> God calls us to seek the peace of where he's placed us, to move in closer, because that's how the world will see his glory and his grace and his truth. Amen. We pray with you. God, we thank you for this call. This call to show your glory and your grace and your truth to all those that we meet. Lord, we ask that as we end this year and move into a new year, you will continue to break into our lives and to continue to transform us and shape us into who you want us to be. In your name we pray. Amen.